Literary Topics is a series of programs produced by the Broadcast Service of the University of Iowa in cooperation with the Department of English at the University. Here is George Starbuck, director of the Writers' Workshop, with tonight's program. I have in front of me in the studio of WSUI two things. It may be hard to put them into relationship, but I'll try. One is an old friend and colleague, Marvin Bell, and the other is a book called A Probable Volume of Dreams, poems by Marvin Bell. It's mint fresh from the publisher, and right on the cover is printed the Lamont Poetry Selection for 1969. Now, there's a strange world in which uh, the NBA doesn't call up associations of Wilt Chamberlain and Lou Alcindor, uh, but suggests people like uh, Bill Styron and uh, Alan Dugan, uh, the National Book Award, and it's a world in which even writers don't live very often, uh, and yet they do. And it can be a kind of terrifying thing for your first book with a major publisher to win something like the Lamont Award. What happens is that uh, a committee of poets who have really made it sit around reading dozens of whole books of poems, each one the darling of its publisher, and finally they pick out just one and say to each other, hey, here's one, he's really made it. Uh, now, you know, this often happens to a decent family man, uh, a photographer, an ex-ham radio operator, uh, a man who has managed to hold off his first major book long enough so that he can even sneak into it a poem about being 30 years old. And uh, maybe he's just come back from uh, playing writer at summer writers' conferences out in Aspen, Colorado, among the beautiful people, and in Corvallis, Oregon, among the beautiful mountains and whatever they have for people out there. Uh, what I really want to ask Marvin Bell is, what does it feel like? And uh, are you terrified? And what does this award have to do uh, with the making of the poems? Well, as you know, uh, having won the other award for your first book, um, there are certain built-in advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages, I suppose, are that uh, winning an award like that is a little like putting a target on the cover. Some people will lay for it with their bows and arrows, and that's okay as far as I'm concerned. Uh, some good books have been published and given awards, and some bad books have been given awards. Uh, likewise, some bad books have not been given awards, and some good books have not been. That's and very I shaky, Marvin. <laughs> <laughs> I try to uh, remember uh, what I think I've always believed, that um, publication of a poem is no mark against it. <laughs> well, I've uh, actually, in asking you that question, I knew I'd get some kind of a shapely answer because uh, Marvin Bell is one of those poets who has sort of fought out all these questions of the lust for fame and the revulsion against that lust uh, in poems he wrote a long time ago, as if he knew this was going to happen to him, and he wanted to get all the attitudinizing about it over first. Uh, I mentioned the NBA, and uh, there's a poem. Well, I won't ask him to read that one yet. There's a poem in which he even talks about coming back to win the National Book Award. Uh, I'd like, because I think it's the most important thing about the poems, finally. It's what holds all their ideas, all their sense of history, all their sense of uh, the human predicament together, to ask for a poem that's rather abstract and quite lyric, uh, and that seems to me a fine introduction to the voice that's in this book. It's called Water, Winter, Fire. Okay. In the little light of dawn, the mercantile ships of Rome slide into the breakers. A rain of waves will hide them forever beneath our dream. We have always known of the buried life, of these sources of treasure and of the washing, the washing we have known. Suddenly, where leaves were, there is nothing. The seasons have shifted above us in an indistinct rustle, frozen finally to silence. We had always suspected the dying of all fruit, 
and the likelihood of turning poisonous during the night. Now that building which has burned so often is burning again. Our books and papers are rising irretrievably into the heavens. Heavier things are up and falling for which there can be no helping. We have dreamt in this life before. Now, suddenly, the air is burning. Now it is useless to be home. Now, before I ask, as I want to, for uh, some examples of that voice being a little more flippant and ironic, uh, let me read something very pompous off the jacket of this mint new book. Uh, I wrote it myself, and I get it tied in knots when I'm asked to do this kind of thing, but I, I believe it, I find, even three months later. It's about the voice in the poems. It is a voice that has long since learned to trust itself to utter contraries, to think of this life, especially when the life feels strange, to live its concern with America, Jewishness, family, issues, history, not in search for the resolving truth, but rather in wait for its own telling disjunctions, for the cool wisecrack giving itself away as outcry. In fact, would you just read On Returning to Teach? Okay, I think that is a poem uh, which does, uh, if any, succeed in doing, uh, which mixes up the kinds of things you um, have seen sometimes uh, put together in poems. I felt a lot of uh, different kinds of feelings on coming back to teach here, in fact, not having planned to. Uh, and it does mention the NBA, which, among other things, stands for the National Book Award. And I want to tell a story about the NBA, which stands for the National Basketball Association, because there's a wonderful credo, uh, which could be a credo for poets as well as others, uh, which was stated by a basketball player named Johnny Kerr, who played for years and years in the National Basketball Association, and I think even set a record for the uh, most games played in consecutively. Well, the fact was that Kerr had very bad legs, extremely bad legs, and he would tape them up. And someone finally asked him, how do you do this? How do you play all these games on these bad legs? And he said, I tell my legs lies. <laughs> he says, I get in there and I say, all right, legs, this is your last game. Just get through this one. Well, this is the poem. It's called On Returning to Teach. At a distance, young voices are hooping, to which my stately fostering mother pays no heed. But as the moon bears with great heaviness waters to itself, one tongue reissues for attention. It is mine. I have come back to win the National Book Award, but am locked in the English department. Let me out. My friends rally round. They were expected to do this with refrains, tunes, lips. With brace and bit and biting epigram, they bore the walls, relief, and welcomed me. At once I wish to share in their spirits, their fitting wits and sensual nostalgia. The short lines in my palms seem to lengthen, and the slapping of their thighs sounds tender. I have been rescued before by black angels and merely observed their disappearance, have walked in the corridor when the one door opened and entered and asked for the moon and laughed, have wanted for a hand, a back, and a brain, and have wanted my women to tell me again. In the second childhood, there are not more children. In the second semester, the teachers are older. That has a great quality which you share with one of your favorite books, that collection of uh, Yiddish epigrams, of being a perfect epigrammatic statement that seems to add up logically to zero. I like those last two lines. <laughs> but uh, it, now that it's happened, is it that bad? I was going to ask you to read a poem called The Perfection of Dentistry, but, uh, and I do want you to read that, but why not just, uh, maybe the Israeli Navy? Because uh, that, well, that's been a favorite poem of mine for a long time. Uh, and uh, I like the way it, it uh, turns out to be a very precise definition about something in the real world, uh, although it starts out about the Israeli Navy. Yeah, uh, I know you've liked it, and, and I've liked it, uh, and I've had a devil of a time publishing it. Um, a lot of people have wanted to publish it, uh, they claim, but not been able to for one reason or another. Um, so I 
That was one of four poems the publisher the, uh, at Athenaeum, uh, the editor at Athenaeum, suggested I eliminate, uh, and which I said I would not. <laughs> uh, this is it, the Israeli Navy. The Israeli Navy sailing to the end of the world, stocked with grain and books black with God's verse, turned back rather than sail on the Sabbath. Six days was the consensus, was enough for anyone. So the world, it was concluded, was three days wide in each direction, allowing three days back. And Saturdays were given over to keeping close, while Sundays, the Navy, all decked out in white and many colored skull caps, would sail furiously, trying to go off the deep end. Yo ho ho, would say the sailors, for six days, while on the shore their women moaned. For years their boats were slow and all show, and they turned into families on the only land they knew. Go ahead and read The Perfection of Dentistry. I, I don't know. I want to say a few things about it even before I let you read it. Um, one thing is, that I guess when I first saw it, when you came back from that summer in Mexico and handed it to me, I thought, what is this, a, a, a bad uh, Jewish, Jewish joke stolen from Phil <laughs> Roth? Since de somehow dentistry is at the heart of so much of that. And uh, um, then I, I began to see, uh, as soon as I read the poem, that it was a, a bad uh, American expatriate joke and Mexican-Mexican joke. And in fact, uh, it's such, a, uh, such an immersion in uh, something that a, I suppose a Henry James critic or something like that could pompously call a, uh, you know, crisis of, of impinging cultures uh, that, uh, you know, it, it's, got, it's got a quality that I think is, is almost essential in poetry these days of being absolutely particular. It's something that no one could have thunk up unless it was living in Guanajuato, Mexico <laughs> in this weird tourist community and uh, suddenly noticing the whole thing in terms of some contrast that you know, like medical practice, dentistry, things like that, attitudes towards health. Uh, and, uh, you know, finally it turns into a poem which uh, one could take as a, as a text for uh, some, you know, revolutionary symposium on uh, what America is and the fact that it would be very dangerous for any particular uh, new left revolutionaries that I can think of to take for a text because it would contain the arguments to demolish them too, is uh, <laughs> sort of clinches it for me as one of my favorite poems. I should point out, I guess, uh, before reading it, that uh, as many people know, no doubt, uh, the uh, Latin Americans consider themselves Americans and refer to us as North Americans, since that turns up in the poem. It's called The Perfection of Dentistry. It's set in Guanajuato, Mexico. Here I am an industry without chimneys, looking for an alternative to abandoning privilege, looking out from my long floral porch, which is not a porch, but an expatriate way of life. He hates her, she hates him, but they can't leave, leaning over the intricate stone railing, over the caretaker asleep on the ground, toward the haciendas on the opposite hill, which seems so luxurious without cactus, Surviving touristas, the physics of the fiesta, and the intimacy of our schizophrenia, we have arrived, not without mercy, to render unto trees and flowers and hills our unnatural, filling-laden homage. Across the way, they may be watching, mineral water in hand, the spectacle-clad vermin, but we do not think ourselves unhealthy if afflicted. We do not think ourselves visited but visitors without undue recompense. If the trees bow slightly, that is all right, and if the flowers bloom indiscriminately, we can accept such favors. We knew before coming we must restore to its altar the spine of the tree and the ebullient blooming to its rightful position. We knew before coming that notoriety was wrong everywhere, though trusting the wealthy North American but the causes of suffering are like impure water, which one must walk beside and ingest until one is covered completely in a sweaty afternoon. 
and the momentum of the rains is like the momentum of the bells penetrating and cleansing the lush cover. Here, every workday is part of a pilgrimage for which the church tolls the approximate hours. It's true, we have paid too much attention to our mouths. We have the expression, like pulling teeth. We have words for the cabinets of our emotions. But the caretaker has pulled his bad tooth without fuss and now weathers his senses in sleep. And we, compensating witnesses, lead his concurrent lives, take place in the garden of his salvation, in the hierarchy of anonymity, and in the masterful units of his siesta, and always did. One more pompous interruption, and then I just want to ask you to read several poems showing how that kind of uh, rich, elliptical putting together of evidence works in more personal subjects, poems out of family, poems to your father and so forth. But, uh, you know, we've been told and told, those of us who read too much modern poetry and too much criticism of it, that great poems contain history. And uh, I like the, that analogy of that phrase, which uh, I guess, is, you know, one thinks of in connection particularly with Pound's cantos, a poem containing history, but uh, I like the analogy to ourselves. Do we contain China with similar efficiency, similar spin-offs and bonuses for the private sector? Um, and poets invent history that we're also told, or reinvent it, or reinvent their own lives. And uh, I suppose one question is, do you invent history like some historian, like the last of the chroniclers, like Pound in the earlier of his cantos and some of the very latest? Or do you maybe invent history as it surrounds you, as it actually happens with you among its objects, with you its only local <coughs> accredited representative in a sort of happenstance moment of life? And uh, for me, that's, that's a... Uh, that latter alternative seems to be a thread that ties together most of these poems of yours uh, from the most public, and there, there are many uh, in the book that are much more public and, and about public issues than that uh, Guanajuato poem, to the most private ones. Well, I'd just like to relax and let you read maybe some of the poems like An Afterword to My Father, Maybe the self-made man, give back, give back, suffering teaches us, things like that. Well, what you say sounds to me right again. I, uh, of the two ways of uh, reinventing, rearticulating history, the latter way would have to be mine because I'm, uh, I have either advantage or disadvantage over some other people in that I'm basically uneducated and stilted. Uh, and I think the latter way would have had to be mine. Um, and afterward to my father, for me, is uh, an interesting poem because it seems to me I discovered what it was really about perhaps a year after finishing it. Uh, it's a short poem. Still the wood I knocked on is the family tree. I'm not a god. I haven't the face for it. Devotion is my disease or a way out. That accounts for sons and for everything. Not so much enough. There is more to be done, yes, and to be done with. You were the sun and moon. Now darkness loves me, the lights come on. I thought uh, when I wrote that 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 would be the last uh, of the many poems I had written to my father, all written after he had died. As it happens, it wasn't, but uh, it could very well have been. Give Back, Give Back is a, another kind of poem. Um, in which a uh, middle-aged woman speaks. And uh, though perhaps I shouldn't mention it, it, uh, it somehow seems to me unfair not to, uh, that what this poem aspires to and I think doesn't really attain is the, the excellence of a couple of poems by Randall Jarrell, uh, one named Next Day and one uh, called The Woman at the Washington Zoo, uh, in which women speak, and perhaps the Meditations of an Old Woman by Theodore Ruski, uh, all of which are marvelous poems, I think. Well, this is a, a shorter poem than any of those. It's called Give Back, Give Back. If I married him for length, 
none was so little so long. How think to explain it? Words I have known are now his. His weight rests under my pillow. I have nothing for floating. My children are of groceries and not of love. None has fallen for years. None come crying as if the middle years were trying to break me of my light warping. I'm not so lucky for looking. On the white sheet of his will, my children inherited the objects of original pleasure, his for which I gave up pleasure, for pleasure, in pleasure, to pleasure. I am the lot of him as is my want, yet have wanted to wear the ring of him, hear it and recreate it. Into the night those marriages go to which woman is bound to be used. All over I hear the breathing pause at the long entrance of the children. That, that's got that quality that can creep up in, in the most abstract poems. It's just plain song. There are such nice uh, uh, starts and stops of rhythm in it. I think Refke wouldn't mind if you <laughs> stopped <laughs> deferring to him about that poem. <laughs> well, having just come from the Northwest, uh, <laughs> where everyone defers to him uh, <laughs> um, and lives under the shadow. Uh, well, verses, versus, verses, the middle word being the Latin versus, V-E-R-S-U-S, versus, 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 um, it's like another kind of poem again in the sense that it sounds different, um, the lining is different. Um, if a common uh, assumption is that uh, art costs one something of one's life, um, which may be true, this is based on the opposite assumption that one's life costs something of one's art, uh, which may also be true. Verses, verses, verses. First, there's the courtship, and that's seven poems, and the marriage costs three, and then comes the first birth, which costs more than just several, although succeeding births grow less expensive but more routine, but then there's the children's schooling, which costs two decades and three or four hundred and thirty-seven poems with some interest, and you worry about borrowing until one night at dinner there's the possibility of retirement and you have them disconnect the utilities, and there go for poems, gas, oil, water, and electricity, and a good meal in a restaurant by this time costs 100 lines with a sonnet for the tip. But you wouldn't have it any other way, and you wouldn't have it any other way. So you're held up, and when you sell out, you throw in six thieves and a title for good measure. I've always thought that poem sounded uh, a little bit, at least I hoped it did, uh, like a poet you... Uh, are very articulate about and very admiring of Alan Dugan. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh, in a way it does. Maybe that's why I don't like it as much as I like some of the others. <laughs> Although, you know, the ones I like, I like with the advantage of having read them on the page several times. And that one, uh, you know, it's nice and clear how it's set up and it unrolls. It's a good platform piece. Uh, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Dugan's another one of those poets that is so utterly clear that he bends your mind and teases you and aggravates you and you never quite know where to have him and yet the voice always assures you that he's there and you just have to uh, you know, give it some time and then, and then suddenly he'll be there. What I love about Dugan's poems is that I can, maybe this is saying the same thing, I can never figure out how he got to where he's going after beginning where he did, uh, although it seems inevitable when he gets there. But the strategies of the poems are so screwy and so wonderful, um, as well as the language. But I, uh, um, most poets, I guess, feel, uh, have a kind of unwarranted but nonetheless genuine assumption that if they could do it, it couldn't be very good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I've never had that feeling about any Dugan poem that I could do it. <laughs> I couldn't. Well, hey, could you read a couple of the short ones that are fairly early on in the book, The Giving In and maybe Changes, and maybe if you want the one after that, because uh, they're <coughs> pertinent to what you were saying there. Okay, The, the Giving In is uh, one of the two earliest poems to be used in this uh, book, A Probable Volume of Dreams, um, a poem from 1962, as I recall. It's a very short poem. And it was the title poem in my thesis when I was a sort of graduate student bum in the workshop here. The Giving In. Once I could ignore birds everywhere. Though they were everywhere, I had to go. Now I go wherever 
birds are everywhere, now I go anywhere, birds go, having gone nowhere, they could not go, that is the half of it. The poem that follows it in the manuscript is The Condition, uh, written in two line stanzas for people who collect that kind of information. The darkness within me is growing. I am turned out. Thought feeds on it, even as the body is eaten. Its goodness is without a face, but it convinces me to look. It can fade from now until doomsday. It will not fade. In the night, I see it shining like a thing seen. And the third poem you referred to is called My Hate. Uh, it's uh, only two lines longer than the condition. Um, I was told by a girl in a high school class in Chicago, uh, to which I was reading poems by myself and other people, that she had heard this poem before my visit and was afraid of me. <laughs> uh, it's called My Hate. My hate is like ripe fruit from an orchard which is mine. I sink my teeth into it. I nurse on its odd shapes. I have grafted every new variety, walked in my bare feet, rotting and detached on the fallen ones. Vicious circle, unfriendly act. I am eating the whole world. In the caves of my ill will, I must be stopped. Did she then shiver all over and fall prostrate at your feet? <laughs> no. <What? laughs> I think I uh, Before I get <laughs> on to the subject of, of the, the Vatic role as, as performed by James Dickey and <laughs> ask you when you're going to make the cover of life, go on, wait a minute. I want you to read the next one now, Changes. I really <coughs> like it. Okay. Uh, this is called Changes. It's about the same length. I've hung and hung around. When I say so, Nothing changes. Do cranes tip over? Cranes tip over. Also, houses burn. In the forest, I come to a clearing. In the rain, the trees overcome me. I'm light. I give in. I'm swallowed in wood. Upright birds, a sense of well-being. At last, I look up with both hands. What about James Dickey? Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, I don't know why I'm on this subject right now, but it, uh, in a way it's the season for it, uh, I think. Uh, you know, the moon and, and uh, there's a nice McLeish sonnet that gets, you know, blazoned all over the networks and the New York Times and so forth. And James Dickey has his moon landing poem already prepared so that it can be set up in type a month before by <laughs> Life magazine. You know, it, it's a, it's a sad, obvious fact of uh, the artistic life in any field. Uh, you can see it if you go into small clubs in small cities and look at uh, would-be nightclub comedians, the would-be Bobby Darrens, whipping their uh, microphone cords around. That uh, you know, we all harbor these longings to be loved and famous. And uh, I think uh, you know one of the main problems that you're ob you obviously have come to grips with successfully is how to keep poetry as uh, tenuous and private and personal and exact uh, a little hum to yourself uh, as it has to be. Uh, it's a weird market. You know, you're trying to sort of sell to a, uh, oh, it's not that the public expects nothing but pizzazz and, and brilliance or something like that, but the whole all the organs of getting poems, works of art, anything out to the public seem conduits designed to, to carry only hot corrosive gases. What do you do with those dreams? Um, how do you, uh, what do you expect? For myself, I can, can talk endlessly about it for the simple reason that I talk endlessly to myself about it, it's, as you uh, guess and as you know from back. Uh, and, uh, I, I do have a little motto which goes something like, no concessions, <laughs> and uh, it doesn't sound very friendly, and I guess it's not, ultimately, but uh, I have a feeling, for example, and this may be completely untrue, but I have a very strong feeling that if a painter has to live or at least visit regularly in New York City, one of the things a poet should do is not go near there. Um, and I think it has to do with uh, 
a view of reality. Uh, I'm getting a little complicated and maybe extremely presumptuous in talking about these things uh, here and now, but um, ultimately, I, I certainly would like my poetry, as any poet would, uh, not to appear to be merely inventive, merely uh, linguistic inventions, no matter what the origin of the poem is, in fact. And this ultimately, is ultimately, it seems to me, depends on uh, a moral basis. Uh, and by a moral basis, I don't mean something prescriptive uh, about how one should lead one's life, really. I mean a view of reality and what that suggests. I, I don't think it would, po would be possible for me, for example, to live in New York among so many poets uh, and not make concessions, little concessions I didn't know I was making every day to their view of reality, including, for example, on a particular basis, their view of politics. Um, I have the feeling, and I, again, may be completely wrong, that Robert Lowell, for example, would be even greater than he is had he not lived in Boston and New York for so many <laughs> years. <laughs> um, also, I, I am lucky, I guess, in uh, already being, having been at work for a long time on poems that sound completely different than those that have just appeared in a probable volume of dreams. Um, I, I may uh, understand things uh, uh, intuitively, as you suggested about that. I never really thought about it, but I do know that the facts are that I don't, uh, the facts are that I don't uh, send poems out to magazines rapidly after they're written, for example. And uh, though I write a great deal and compulsively, I wind up throwing out much more than I wind up keeping. And those are built-in safeguards, although they're just just lucky things. Well, you mentioned Lowell, but surely if, if you had been able to grab Lowell by the scruff of the neck 20 years ago <coughs> and tell him where to live, in spite of the fact that for one year once he did tool around Iowa City at a reputed 12 <laughs> miles an hour in a giant black used <laughs> car, uh, surely you wouldn't have suggested to him that the, the antidote to Boston and New York was to go live in Iowa City, uh, no. surrounded by uh -uh. Uh, all these, you know, appallingly talented 22, 23 year old writers. Well, how to deal with that, as you well know, is a real uh, delight and problem at the same time. The students are intimidating and challenging and rewarding and wonderful and horrible and everything all at once. And I guess, um, now, I, you mentioned I just came back from the Northwest. I'd never seen the Northwest before, and I uh, spent a lot of time traveling and seeing a lot of things, even to the point of knowing what I was seeing. Um, and I concluded, uh, as I'd always suspected of myself, that I preferred people to landscape, much as I could love landscape at some times. And so uh, I guess I'm lucky uh, being here in Iowa City with so many good students. Sometimes I feel like escaping, indeed. but. Most of the time, uh, the students, number one, turn me on, and number two, teach me. Yeah. Well, if you're fighting against, to, to live up to your motto, against concessions, against being influenced, like what, what's the major front for that battle is against the students here? What do you have to fight against? What do you have to uh, uh, well, being a false prophet, for one thing. Again, the terms I use sound a little presumptuous for me at the moment. But I, um, for example, I, you remember the strikingly good group of students who came in two years ago, or three years ago, maybe it was four years ago I, now. <laughs> uh, I was just coming back here myself, and here were all these terrific students who had come in in a, an abnormally large entering class as graduate students in the poetry workshop. And they were just incredibly talented, and they, they even got along well and taught each other. And uh, they were very talented, also very prosaic in the way they wrote. and. Uh, all of us who were teaching in the workshop at that time gradually created in them um, a sense of imagination which took over to the point that we had created a monster, uh, the imaginative poem machine. And uh, at that point, um, I remember being terribly torn and thinking to myself I had done something wrong, uh, even though the results seemed wonderful. I mean, they were writing poems that were, were published in all the best magazines. Many of them had already published books. Um, I was learning some of the same things they were learning, and, and it would became very difficult for me to sort out uh, my actions in the classroom and figure out what they meant, uh, how the students figured in them, what they created in the students, and what was right and what was wrong about it. And I, I think in a way I've backed off a little bit uh, from the students. I, I find now, for example, that a lot of times I don't tell them things I could tell them which... Um, 
ineffective tricks <laughs> mm. by which they could make their poem sound all the better. Um, I find myself pulling up short and pretending I don't know. Um, well, to, to on a hope yeah. that they'll just let themselves happen in some peculiar way that will be the new sound, or what? I, uh, partly that, and partly because uh, I'm afraid of uh, teaching them a trick they can imitate forever. Um, I think, uh, I keep in pretty good contact, as do you, with a lot of the students who have left here, and I just saw a number of them, in fact, and uh, they're all, the, the students from the group I was talking about, very talented group, have all, it seems to me, had a year or two of, of a kind of difficulty in their writing. Um, it became so easy for them to imitate a kind of poem they've been successful at already, um, that they, number one, imitated it and felt unhappy about it, and number two, tried to break with it completely, ignoring all the good things in their writing. And uh, some of them have floundered around for a while before finding their way back to themselves, in a sense. I don't know if any of that makes sense. It, it does to me. Oh, it does to me, too, but it's getting, it's <laughs> shop talk that uh, we probably, we don't do much of and probably should stay away from if we hope to be silly enough <coughs> and, and uh, unpredictable enough as teachers. But let's, I, I want to give you a chance, for God's sake, to read some of the new poems. Um, would you start reading Impotence? Suddenly her breast has never been larger. All night she's been on your back. How can you tell her your testicles have fallen off? It's serious, all right. It's just the beginning. When the balls go, can the penis be long behind? Soon you'll be left with nothing but scar tissue where once you were the cock of the walk. Soon you'll be the laughing stock of Niagara Falls. It's no delight you've got yourself over this barrel. You knew how far down it was from the beginning. All those years you were combing it out of your hair, the hair itself was falling out. If now you're exposed as a foolish romantic, why, that's what you deserve, foolish romantic. You wanted orgasm and repose. You wanted love without memory. You earnestly desired beautiful women in bondage, their feelings held hostage. And for a while there, you were right in the thick of it. Now you have the lowest membership of all. Now you are nothing anyone would love. Now you are a figure of total submission. So what if you could do anything once? Why are you even bringing up these matters of taste? Now the end is near. Now you limp along. Goodbye, A. Goodbye, B. Don't hate me, C. Farewell, D. I'm not letting you go. Just turning you over for a while. Well, the other thing I've been writing is a, a sequence. Um, it seems like everybody's writing a sequence. And uh, uh, this sequence um, uh, began a while ago before some of the more notorious sequences were published, and I didn't see any reason to abandon it. What's because a notorious of those sequence? Well, the most notorious sequence uh, <laughs> right now maybe is the dream songs, although in another year it will be. maybe Lowell's had taken over. Well, in another year I think that one will be, the notebooks of Lowell. Um, and an awful lot of other people are writing sequences, uh, trying to break out of... Well, Lowell said in an interview somewhere that uh, asked about contemporary poetry in general, and he said, well, contemporary American poets do a very difficult thing very well. And it's true. So well and so often, in fact, that we all are trying to <laughs> do something else, I guess. Um, and this, is, uh, this begins as what could be called a love sequence in the sense that love sequences are allowed to contain love, hate, uh, marriage, divorce, and everything else. And a strange thing has happened, maybe not so strange, uh, really, and that is that the poem has broadened itself to uh, include aspects of what is loosely termed social concern. And uh, I think, I guess I know where the poem's going to end. It seems to have to be written at great emotional ex uh, cost. My, my uh, tendency is to want to pay uh, the expense all at once. And uh, I had hoped to have it done last fall. Now I hope to have it done this fall, and I know I'm not going to make it. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can find something from it. Uh, well, here's one called a biography. Poetry cripples, tempus fugi. Have removed from the literary wars the hand of a gentleman in quill, 
the blackberry ink mixed with tears, who sought the ingratitude of his day as a sculptor clay or an alchemist brass, poet or poem, life or art. He cared for his judgments in their prisons. He likened himself to a convict. He lifted his vision to the window. He dug for the treasures of life. He entered the solitary's tunnel. Women he loved, he surrendered as leaf falls for the love of leaf. Felons he insulted and readers perverted. In the cave of the senseless it all fit. The thin shafts the stars shone down could not lighten his life at hard labor. Do you want me to go on? And go on. <laughs> um, well, just sort of casting about for uh, pieces that sound a little different than other pieces of the sequence. Here's one with the title, Honey Swaki Mali Paws. And the first two syllables of the first word are italicized, which is <laughs> why I say it's so funny. Metaphysical, not pornography, to say we balanced each other. Some thought it bad to exercise unless trying to have children. If we had a thousand, it wouldn't be enough, but just crowded. On a lonely isle, you are my idea. In a slow dream of going across China, you are company. But still, I don't love you because I have no choice. I love your voice, saying nothing but moans, no eyes, no moons, pushing the black back by the virtues of your sex, which are those parts of you, heart but one and that figurative, I enter into I love. Hey, look, uh, let me interrupt, because I think that just at least for those who uh, like to think about uh, that long tradition of Western love poetry and all the Petrarchan poems and things like that, there's a lot to think about while listening to that simple little poem. So why don't you read it again, if you can find it. I already let you turn the page, okay. didn't I? Yeah. <coughs> Metaphysical not pornography, to say we balanced each other. Some thought it bad to exercise unless trying to have children. If we had a thousand, it wouldn't be enough but just crowded. On a lonely isle, you are my idea. In a slow dream of going across China, you are company. But still, I don't love you because I have no choice. I love your voice, saying nothing but moans, no eyes, no moons, pushing the black back by the virtues of your sex, which are those parts of you, heart but one, and that figurative, I enter into I love. Here's another one. It's called The Embrace. This song for you is full of shark. This indiscretion, like graffiti, is made public to please you. Fine lady, can we come together, fish who rise from prey, who scribble in the temporary waters a line of greatest resistance? After the first year, I fainted. Nobody wants you when you're down and out. Clip the tender parts together, they said, joined, holy, because married. Nobody escapes this life together who gets away from himself. I suppose walking into water until too late, I imagine the clothes neatly bent in a nearby pile the body floats from. I imagine the horror with which I find you, discovering downstream the day before yesterday how much you loved me to hold on to. I could, uh, since we have the time, speak a little more to points you've raised uh, and that I said before I speak endlessly to myself about. I've written uh, something between... Uh, Oh, seven and eight hundred poems. I found out one night when I wanted some compulsive activity besides writing and <laughs> started counting them. Uh, most of them bad, of course. Um, and I look upon myself as a beginner, uh, very definitely. I, I have in my mind some lines that uh, will be a book, or, uh, well, lines which for me suggest possibilities for poems that could be a book after the sequence even. And so that's what I see myself as moving toward insofar as one can, you know, see it. <laughs> um, I do have other miscellaneous poems that don't fit in the sequence. Um, here's one which takes uh, emotional risks I didn't take previously and which is pre pretty open and I think can be uh, read uh, and be accessible to listeners. It's called Set in Hollywood Hills. 
You are such lively, lovely animals as inhabit the inaccessible tan cliffs, though nothing grows there. You are those strong signals my whole head is a beam for receiving from the beaches where my desire was wet more than we remember. Guess what? We get to drink again tonight in our separate refrigerated bedrooms. I love you. I don't even know you. The face of the clock makes time more deluxe than we knew it in childhood. I'm growing up because I can't have you. And no one touches or touches by speaking in your sunny city. Everyone is so busy and successful. The beach is only a paperweight to hold down the executive's elusive script of those illusory lives you star in. My life, my love, I don't even know you. I want you to give up being a dictionary. I want you to stop your familiar quotations. I know a hundred Shakespeare's. I know many Mozart's, Hitler's too, Napoleon's and Josephine's, Juliet's to Romeo's. I want you to be life after death, deceasing. I want you to have a heart attack figuratively over me, a final inability at work. I want you to love me and let me explain poorly, undramatically, not without touching. Could you go back and say no if you don't want to? But there's a little poem in the book called Suffering Teaches Us that uh, it's, you know, another one of those that you do occasionally in a woman's or a girl's voice. And uh, I'd, I'd like to hear that. <laughs> okay. Uh, the first two lines of this poem are given. I uh, come out of a dialogue with a, a girl who uh, was somewhat desperate and needed advice. Not that I necessarily had the, the right advice. It's called Suffering Teaches Us. The entire poem, which is pretty short, is in quotation marks, and it's written in two-line stanzas. If you can know a saint, you can know my mother. And I have suffered to be her daughter. And I have offered to be my mother. And I have found no way to be her. Suffering teaches us what suffering teaches. I never saw fairer judging my father. And he who was fairer judged not my mother. For what shall become in a motherless home? Just as a teacher, uh, let me ask you one last question. Maybe it'll be the last question. You've mentioned, obviously with admiration, Reske and Jarrell and Dugan. Uh, you know, who, who else do you think people ought to be reading? And oh, who, you know, who, yeah. who's, uh, <coughs> there's so much, I just, you know, I despair sometimes when I see the uh, brochures that come into our English department and come into places all over the country of people who have set themselves up as representatives of the art of poetry and go around uh, mainly, uh, you know, talking to women's club audiences and taking perfectly good audiences and simply confirming them in the idea that poetry is a kind of uh, pointless, sentimental dither uh, out of which somebody emerges with uh, romantically flowing <laughs> hair. You know, who, who would you like, if you were going to be cultural commissar, who would, who would you like to uh, institute in the curriculum and make people <laughs> read so that they could think and enjoy? An awful lot of people uh, just thinking from one of my contemporary poets, um, George Starbuck for one, mm -hmm. and a lot of others, not only Rusky Jarrell and uh, uh, whoever I mentioned before, but uh, James Wright, for example, and uh, David Ignato, a poet very often overlooked, uh, John Logan, Galway Cannell, Alan Dugan, uh, W.S. Merwin, um, Sylvia Plath, the late Sylvia Plath, uh, books by Anne Sexton, by a poet named Russell Edson, uh, even uh, a man named Eli Siegel, the leader of the only literary cult left around, uh, and a very uneven but uh, often interesting poet, I think, and many, many, many more, uh, including poets whose methods of composition I have little serious sympathy for, though I enjoy them in classrooms, uh, poets like the late Frank O'Hara, uh, John Ashbery, and Kenneth Cope, who uh, are very, very good uh, in what they do. And uh, many others, too. In a way, my answer is not very useful because it's so broad. 
Mm. Uh, my love has always been for the materials, as you know. I, I like a, a little quatrain by the great Spanish poet Antonio Machado, uh, which goes, people possess four things that are no good at sea, anchor, rudder, oars, and the fear of going down. And I take that and uh, some other little stories and poems that I like to repeat as, as credos indicating uh, that one's love for the materials comes first and that out of the materials comes something other than what the conscious mind is capable of in its ordinary moments. So for me, poetry is a way of changing my life and of changing my sensibility. And it really is. I don't have to make that up. I can go back and uh, show myself, as I periodically do, the rather uh, gibberish-like idiosyncratic beginnings of my work and the many other ways in which I wrote idiosyncratic gibberish-like poetry and simple-minded poetry and many other things on the way to whatever it is I now write. And I can see that my mind has actually changed. Uh, and uh, uh, I feel indebted to those poems somehow. Um, I, I don't think, going back to where the, this whole uh, tape began, I, I, uh, I don't think I'm going to be tempted ever to imitate uh, poems I've written because in the first place I'm not sure I can and in the second place I'd, it just holds no interest to me whatsoever. I like all the rewards everyone else likes and want them uh, even more than other people do sometimes but um, at the same time I um, as you know as you know the writing itself is uh, lonely hard work in which uh, no one's advice is really heeded except the really good pieces of advice that have come indirectly and by other people's examples and which are lodged deep in your mind and you don't have to articulate for yourself, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> what, what do you imagine yourself writing when you, you know, when you, you get one of those lonely megalomaniac dreams and think um, what, uh, you know, what big poem or big sequence, what, uh, you know, what, what would the critics all <coughs> say after I had achieved my magnum opus? What had it done to America? Uh, I don't know. I have. I'm not. I'm not so sure as the scientists who predict that people will pretty much stop reading, uh, that books will be not only physically obsolete but that writing itself will be obsolete. I'm not sure they're wrong, and I'm not. I'm not in favor of that. But ultimately, it doesn't matter to me. I. I like to understand myself in my own life, um, and. Uh, and to, to use the medium in certain ways. I don't know whether I could write anything I would call a magnum opus. I, I mean, e even, you know, just hypothesizing for a moment. And um, I, I know I want to get this sequence finished. That's important to me. Uh, and I know I have some lines, um, about six lines that suggest possibilities for me, lines I mentioned before. And I can remember the first two, for example. Um, I think there's, uh, the rain is too heavy a whistle for the certainty of charity. <laughs> now, th <laughs> those lines may not make a good deal of sense said like this over the air, but uh, they make a lot of sense to me as possibilities somehow for some kind of poetry, which I don't think I'm quite capable of writing yet. And I don't mean surrealism. I don't mean, for example, the f very fine poems of uh, Merwin's The Lice or even the poems of The Moving Target. I, I mean something else, though I'm not quite sure I can say what I mean at this point. Well, is there some particular poem you want to close with by reading? Well, uh, I guess we have about that much time. Well, I'll, just just I'll pick one myself, but I might <laughs> as well give you some leeway for a change. Is there one you would prefer oh, I use? No, no, go ahead. Pick. Somehow all of Eastern Europe and, and the, the Jewish <laughs> uh, family background that, that crops up occasionally in that book uh, has been skipped over or, <coughs> or omitted here. Uh, and that, you know, that opens a whole other area of questioning about how uh, the Jewish poets and consciously Jewish American poetry is emerging as it probably should thoughtfully a generation or so after the American Jewish novel seems to have emerged. Uh, but just... Uh, yeah, I, I must admit, I, I think I feel and act uh, more Jewish in a way uh, than I did as a young boy, even though I went to Hebrew school for a while. Um, and I think that has something to do with defiance. Uh, I'm not quite sure what, but I would have loved to have been born in Defiance, Ohio. <laughs> uh, well, here's a poem I can finish with. It's called Mexico, the Storm. It comes out of that same summer in Mexico, and it's about as polemical a poem as I have ever written, I guess. It has detachable parts in the middle with their own titles. Mexico, the Storm. 
Water and the cost of living have been rising. The scalloped winged butterfly clings to the leaf and will not fly. This is the American season against which the tide of public opinion is moving. In these Mexican mountains, writing by flashlight, the lightning a curse on the head of the morning, I address the lovelorn, the muses, and politicians to wish them new objects for their affections. For too many quarrelsome marriages have been preserved, and too many dishonest men have written about writing, and too many holders of office have shut their doors to the lovers, authors, and reformers who needed work. The mistress. She rode a long bus to a quarrelsome marriage from which she derived children's pleasures and the pleasures of children, but nothing from outside. She has a recipe for leftovers and a cure for heartburn. The poet. You were copywriting the horses when your favorite horse ran out of color. You were amused to see such sport. You had a highly developed sense of multiple choice. You had good manners and a schedule, but no moral. The politician. The machine squawks at the encroachment of civility. It is a model of categories and thinks, but not well. The machine suggests you destroy the small countries. Lady Godiva advises you to get dressed. She might as well. My son, in my undershirt, walks the night like an angel to explain his nightmare in which all the armies fought. And so much is believable in the words of this child who has always a point to make about parenthood or youth. The storm has frightened him into fresh narrative, and he has a name for a giant fish he will catch, if permitted. The backfiring buses jam the passes to market, and the fish grows in the lightning. The huge reptile is amorous, aesthetic, and political, and needs coaxing, but may suffer itself to be caught. So while thunder, water, and the tin roof clap, we fish, first for the feeling, then for the fable, then for the fish. That's a great ending. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, a good poem to end with. Uh, I'm George Starbuck, and I've been talking with and listening to the poetry of Marvin Bell, whose recent book just out with Athenaeum is called A Probable Volume of Dreams. George Starbuck is director of the Writer's Workshop at the University of Iowa. Marvin Bell is a member of the workshop faculty. The program series is Literary Topics, produced in cooperation with the University of Iowa Department of English. Next week, contemporary American poet Donald Justice from Syracuse University will read from his work in a recording made during his recent appearance at Iowa. Here is an Iowa poem dating back some years. That is, the setting is Iowa. Uh, the town of Ladora, uh, which you may have encountered in, uh, to, to the west of here somewhere. It used to be a small town. I haven't seen it in years. It may be a metropolis now, but the odds are probably against it. Poem to be read at 3 a.m. Accepting the diner on the outskirts, the town of Ladora at 3 a.m. was dark but for my headlights, and up in one second story room, a single light where someone was sick or perhaps reading as I drove past at 70, not thinking this poem is for whoever had the light on. That was poet Donald Justice of Syracuse University reading from his work. Hear the complete program one week from tonight at 8 o'clock. Future programs in the series Literary Topics will include presentations by British poet, critic, and translator Michael Hamburger. Literary Topics is a recorded presentation of the broadcast service of the University of Iowa.